I could have sworn he was going to complain again about me using all his firewood that night. Um, <laughs> um, man, it is good to be here. Good to be back. Uh, we are now in Winston-Salem at a church. We're having a lot of fun. It's been a great, great time for us so far. And uh, man, we love, we love you guys. We love being back here. If you've never met me, my name is Garrett Huxman. Welcome to Lakeshore Church because you're in the last five months. You're kind of new. So that's cool. Um, I hope, here's something we like to talk about in my church. Um, I hope that you all were paying attention during that last song. I hope you all kind of grasped what it's like to be a part of a worshiping church. This, this room where you, you come together and you all have like minds, you all have the same desire to worship the same God, you lift your voices together and no one's, no one's leaving you out there by yourself. We're all singing together and and when you feel that moment, you realize this is why this is why the Sunday morning time is so important as a church because because we all come in here with a lot of things going on, but we get to just worship our Savior together. And it gives us encouragement and strength and, and joy to go for the next week, and we get to go out and be Christ ambassadors out there in this world, but we get to come together and be a family and body together. And so I hope you don't just think that's some lackluster thing. That is one of the most important things we can have as Christians. And I was glad to be part of it today. Uh, your band is awesome. I hope you love them. And I hope you're glad that they're your band. Um, but man, so my, my dad's a pastor and he was found himself at a lunch one time and he was eating with two other pastors and they were both, you know, all three were leading churches. I don't know if you know this about pastors, but we like eating lunch. And, um, if you guys are all going, no, I don't really want to get lunch with you today, we go, hey, other pastor across town, you want to get lunch? Today? Yeah, I do. And um, so we get lunch together. And so then my dad was at lunch like this one time. But what was weird about it was he found himself at a lunch in Jerusalem with a, a Jewish Christian pastor and a Palestinian Christian pastor and, and him, a redneck from South Carolina. And, and they're all sitting there around this table, and this guy grew up in Israel, and this guy grew up in, in Palestine, he was part of the PLO at one point, and he was, and, and they're sitting there, and they're all doing the same thing. They're all part of the same mission. They're all part of the same church, and they all have the same calling on their lives, and they're sitting there, and they're sharing stories with each other about what it's like to just be in the fight together. And, and the question I have for us today that's going to launch us into our parable for the, the day, the question is this, how does that happen? How does a lunch table like that come to be? Because when you look at a church and you look at, I remember we, I, we, we were praying over there in the corner over there the night before we were launching as a campus and we were doing all the work to plant this church and all that sort of stuff. And I remember we were going around praying and I was looking at the people praying and I remember sitting there thinking just in a small room where I was going, if it was up to me, if it was my job to just go out and hand pick people, I could not put that group of people together. And then you come to church every single week, and you start looking around, you start seeing where the people have come from, where, and where, they've, where they're going, and what's happening, you kind of, and you look at the moment of your church, and you kind of go, I could not have just, no one could have just handpicked everybody, no one could have just said, this is the people who are going to show up, and, and yet, we're all here, and God has brought us together. And the question is, how, do, how does God take a person from this corner of the world, and a person from that corner of the world, and, and bring them together under the same umbrella? the same mission, under the same Savior. Well, that is because of our parable today. Because our parable is one of those things that tells us how the message of Christ spreads so far and wide. To where two men who would have, without Jesus Christ, grown and lived their entire lives, not only just not knowing each other's names, but being sworn enemies to each other, are now brothers and friends sharing a room together. You're doing this uh, series called The Parables. Our church is actually doing it as well. And we're going through an entire sermon on uh, uh, the whole summer. We're just going to look at different parables of Jesus. And, and what we're saying in our church is that these, <laughs> these parables are strange similes. That's what they are. They are <laughs> Jesus is comparing this unknown thing called the kingdom of heaven, and he's comparing it to these known things like seeds and fields and dirt. And he's comparing them using the words like or as, right? Right? Grammar, we all went to class. It's a simile, right? And he's teaching us little 
glimpses of what the kingdom of heaven is like so that we can step back at the end and kind of take this big picture uh, and see what is the kingdom of heaven like. And so we're taking the whole summer to do it. And, and this week we're in Matthew chapter 13, verse, where are we? 33. Uh, he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. That's the whole parable, by the way. Some take more, some require more reading than others. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you read as I lay dying in high school, but we were all dying for the day where we get to read the chapter that my mom is a fish, and that's the whole reading for the homework. Yeah, okay, one person. All right. No one else did their homework. All right. Um, that's the parable. And this parable is a very important parable for me. It's one of my favorite parables, and it has been for about 10 years. And, and what we hear in this parable is Jesus is telling us he, he, uh, this parable is a confession. It's a mode of operation, and it's a good thing. That's what we're going to be looking at today. It's a confession, it's a mode of operation, and it's a good thing. And so what do I mean by it's a confession? Well, Jesus used these parables to teach about what the kingdom of heaven was like. And in, in the, the very first week, you guys talked about the seeds of the sower, and that one has a lot going on in the Bible, because it's also the one that Jesus uses to teach us why he did the parables, and, why, and how to understand the parables, and how to, how to kind of interpret the parables. And so he goes through the whole thing and teaches us again. But also, in that very first part of Matthew 13, they come up to Jesus and they actually ask him a direct question. The disciples came to him and they asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. This is why I speak in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not understand. And so what he's saying is, I'm speaking in parables so that I can teach and I can speak openly, but I don't have to give everybody all the information. And this parable is a very good example of why he had to do that. Because so far in Jesus' ministry, in his life, his ministry is getting a little bit hairy. All right? Things are getting kind of tenuous. There's uh, tripwires all over the place. Um, the last time he did a big public sermon, is called the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah? And he just kind of said what he thought. It's pretty blunt, all right? He just went, yeah, you think adultery is better. Well, I don't want you lusting either and all these sorts of things. Don't murder, yeah, but don't even get mad at people. All these sorts of things. It's just out there. This is what I think. This is what I believe. But between that sermon and this sermon, uh, people have started trying to kill him. And so he has started speaking less openly. Because one of the big themes in the Gospel of John, you might notice, is it says often, my hour has not yet come. No one's going to take my life from me, but I'm going to give it up. But I'm not ready to die yet because I still have work to do down here. And so he's speaking in such a way that even though he's speaking to people, they hear it, but they don't understand. And they can see it, but they don't see it. And, and the reason he needs to do that is because this parable is a confession for what Jesus is trying to do with his mission. It's a confession for what he's aiming at. It's a confession of what his ultimate goal is. And do you know what it is? World domination. I did not say a world of denominations. I didn't say that. <laughs> Where you kind of look side-eyed and people go, are you really a Christian? I don't know. Um, no, world domination. He wants it all. He wants every last bit of it. He wants his message to go out, and he wants it to spread until it covers the whole thing. He says the knowledge, this is in Habakkuk, it's an Old Testament minor prophet, it says the, the knowledge, uh, the earth will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. He's going for everything. And he's, he's aiming for everyone. He's aiming for everything, and he's expecting to hit the aims at. Jesus is like, uh, you remember that scene from uh, You've Got Mail? That was a rhetorical question because everybody remembers You've Got Mail. Um, so Tom Hanks plays a character. He's the heir of Barnes & Noble, basically. Fox 
books. It's kind of like being the heir of Amazon, but because um, <laughs> no one cares about whatever. Um, and so and he's coming to town, and he's buy, he's just buying up all these bookstores, and people are losing their small independent bookstores and the whole thing. And Meg Ryan's a bookstore owner, and she meets him one day in her bookstore, and, and all she knows about the man is that when he walks into her store, he has these two cute kids, and one of them can even spell fox, F-O-X. It's pretty cool. And so it's this whole thing, and they're talking to each other, and it's fun, and then he leaves. And then she sees him at a cocktail party where it's all these publishers and stuff like that, and she just never likes these kind of things. And she sees this guy who's fun to be around. She goes, no way, it's you. And he gets super uncomfortable when he walks away, gets out of the conversation, and then another bookstore owner comes up and goes, I cannot believe you were talking to him. She's like, why? He's like, that's Fox. You know the guy who's going to own everything? That's what Jesus is saying here. I want it all. I'm going to own everything. And people don't like that when you say that. People don't like it when one person is going for everything. And so Jesus is confessing this, but he's saying it in the terms of a parable. He's saying it by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a woman making bread. And she gets a little bit of yeast here, but when she's done working it, it's going to fill the whole thing. And we know that he would die because of this, because uh, eventually they killed him for saying it. Right? He was killed under this man named Pontius Pilate, and, and when they first brought him to Pilate, they said, he's blaspheming our God, and he's like, well, I don't care. Um, and he goes, well, he's also saying he's king. He goes, wait a second. And, um, and then he dies. Um, spoiler. I don't know who's, if you're halfway through the book or not, but it's, <laughs> that's his goal. He wants it all. And he's just saying it to his disciples. And people are hearing it, but they're not getting it. But one day we will. And we will all have to admit, we will all have to deal with the fact that Jesus wants everything. And as we approach this Jesus, we will have to do so knowing that he is bringing us the kingdom of heaven. We're not voting him to be the president of heaven. He's the king. And he's in charge. And that's the decision we have to make with Jesus. Now, um, the second thing is that this is, uh, this is the little connection I made earlier in my life that made this such a wonderful parable for me, is that this is also a mode of operation. <laughs> this is also a way that Jesus has always dealt with his people. It's how he's always dealt with the world. He says that the kingdom of heaven is like uh, in a, in a woman making bread, and then she puts it in it, and she just works it and works it and works it, and then it just fills the whole thing. And I've always had this image come to my mind of God standing over the globe and he's looking at it and he's going, man, it is in complete rebellion against me. We are running away from him as fast as humanly possible. And then he says, I'm going to just put a little bit of my message in here and I'm going to just work this planet until it's filled with my glory. And he goes to one man named Abraham. He says, Abraham, I want you to go. I want you to go from here to there. This is what he does. This is God takes people and he moves them from here to there. He takes that person, moves them from there to there. That person from here to here. And I go, well, I'm already standing here. He's like, yeah, but I want that guy there. I want you over there. And I go, okay, fine, whatever. And he tells Abraham, he goes, listen, I need you to go. I need you to leave your family. Leave your nation. Leave the things you understand. Leave the people. Leave your security. And I just want you to go. And the Bible says, even though Abraham did not know where he was going, he went. He said, yes, I'll go. And his family grew and it spread. And it grew and it spread. And it grew and it spread. And so his family, his, the nation of Israel, found itself in all kinds of places and all kinds of situations. They found themselves in slavery and in freedom. They found themselves in a land they called their own and in the, the courtrooms of the greatest kings of the human history. One was even the queen of Persia. They found themselves everywhere. They found themselves all over the place, in the wilderness and, and, and in, their own, in, in their own land. And by the time that Jesus was born, the people of Israel, the Israelites, they were all over the Roman world. 
to the point where whenever there were big holidays, the population of Jerusalem would swell by three or four times because not everyone who was Jewish lived there. They were scattered all over the place. And then Jesus shows up, and he does it again. Jesus dies on the cross, and he raises from the dead, and he takes his 12 followers, and down to 11, or he's already losing some, and he goes, hey guys, I want you to go. I want you to go into all the world. I want to take you from here to there. I just want to move you around. And as you are going, I want you to make disciples. And I want you to baptize them. And I want you to teach them everything I've taught you. Because this is how God works. He's just working this world until he's filling the whole thing with his worshiping people. And I believe that as God moves you from here to there, he will develop in you things that I want to call Christian skills. Because uh, the chances are that Jesus is trying to talk to you in the exact same way he's always talked to his people. Chances are that you and I are getting little whispers in our ears from God that are very similar to the way he's always talked to his people. Where he's going, hey, why don't you go over there? Hey, why don't you just go talk to that person and see what happens? And you go, because I don't want to go talk to that person. <laughs> and if I know anything about people, he probably doesn't want me to talk to him either. That's a good point. But maybe he does want you to talk to him. And the rubber meets the road. And you can go, yes, I'll, I'll go from here to there. Or we can not. But here's what I believe. I believe that as we say yes when God talks to us, he will develop in us Christian skills. And I don't necessarily mean spiritual, uh, spiritual gifts, because those can be kind of specific, but I mean skills that are beneficial in your life following Jesus. Skills that are helpful in your, your goal to follow Jesus where he calls you. And so I was thinking of some things like, what could be Christian skills that are helpful for us? And here's some. Evangelism is the, obviously, the obvious one, right? But that's the one we kind of shrink back from, get kind of scared. But there are some simpler steps to take. There are easier ways to get in. Here's some other ones. Um, being quick to listen and slow to speak. Not keeping a record of wrong. Bearing one another's burdens. You know, when, when you find out someone's in pain or suffering or having going through a hard time, what we all, most of us tend to just avoid that like the play, right? No one wants to be the person around that because we don't know what to say or we don't know what to do or we don't we feel uncomfortable. And, you know, there's a skill you can develop on how to help bear one another's burdens. Some of us, we really have a heart for those situations. We really want to help people, but maybe you don't have the skill set, so maybe you're kind of overbearing in that situation. Or worse, maybe you embarrass the person you're trying to help. You kind of go, okay, what's the skill? Like, and, and, and you can learn it. These are things you can develop. How to bear one another's burdens. Hospitality. Practice in it. Man, the more you do it, the better you get. Um, and encouragement. Grace. Speaking a timely word in people's lives. Speaking the truth in love. Being a person of both grace and truth. These things, these are things the Bible talks about. I like to think of them as Christian skills. Skills that God can develop inside of you. You listen to that and go, well, I don't know how to do most of those things. You go, okay, fine. But maybe God can develop them in you as you say, yes, I'll go from here to there. Um, about sometime last year, I decided, you know, I just need to bite the bullet and um, read The Lord of the Rings because I'd never done it before. And uh, I thought it was going to be a really big, it was actually turned out to be a pretty quick read. Fellowship of the Ring was awesome. I just, that's the only one I've read so far. But isn't it annoying when you have a friend that reads Lord of the Rings, all of a sudden they have an illustration for every part of life? <laughs> Anyways, I got this part where Frodo's in a cave, and um, so he's walking through a mountain, and the, the whole crew's under there. It's completely dark. They have this little tiny flicker of light, 
And Gandalf, who's a wizard, I don't know if anyone missed the story, Lord of the Rings. You know, um, and they're following just a little Lord of the Light, and they're just, that's all they have. It's super dark, they can't see anything. And Frodo's walking through, and he realizes something he didn't know about himself. He can see in the dark better than everybody else can. Something he never knew about himself. And then he goes and they get to this other place and all the, everyone has to be led through this area and they have to have their face covered because they're not allowed to be there and, and Frodo can't see anything. But then he begins to realize he can smell and hear things better than he used to. He can kind of feel his surroundings better than anybody else. And as he's going forward in his story, he's realizing things are developing within him he did not previously have. He did not really know that, that he could do those things until he found himself in a position where he had to use them because he couldn't operate like he always did. And he realized things were developing inside of him he did not previously have. And here's what's interesting. Frodo has one massive advantage in this, in this idea of developing new skills. And I know you're thinking, yeah, it's a magical ring and a wizard. And... <laughs> And the answer is no, because he had both of those for 17 years and did nothing with them. Something Peter Jackson failed to mention. Um, the, whatever. Um, so, he, the advantage that Frodo has over us is that Frodo's life happens to him. He has very few options. He thinks often about going home, but he can't. He thinks often about quitting, but he can't. He thinks often about staying put and not moving, but he can't. He has to move forward. His life is happening to him. And you and I don't have that. We go through our lives with our finger on the agenda button and our hands on the parking brake and every time we start feeling this move into some uncomfortable thing we go no 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 back to my cold sack i can know what everything is i can predict it i can control it every time we feel ourselves getting moved into some un uncertainty we go well, where's the eject button i'm going to i'm going to get out of here and go back to what i can control and i'm going to live in the place where i can all have lived, use the skills I already know I have, do the things I already know how to do, and we're going, Man, but God's going, I can develop new things in you. In five years from now, you can look back and go, how did, I could have never done this five years ago. But God's going, I'm developing this in you. I'm developing a new skill in your life. If you'll just move when I say move. If you'll go when I say go. Be willing to have conversations you don't have the answers to. Go to places you don't know what to say. And develop new Christian skills. Because this is how Jesus has always operated with his people. He has always operated like there's a little bit of yeast and he's going to work that world until it fills the whole thing. And if you and I won't do it, then we're, we're that log. We're that log jam in a long line of billions of Christians who've come before us who say yes along the way. And we go, no, 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 no. I have this, this great little eject button where I can get out of any situation I don't want to be in. And we're not following the line of Christians who've come before us who've just said yes. I will speak when God tells me to speak. I'll be quiet when God tells me to be quiet. I'll move when God tells me to move. This is what he does. He works the world like a woman works dough. And finally, our final point is, this is a good thing. I know no one likes no one likes the idea of one person being in control. No one likes the idea of someone just saying, "Hey, whatever I say, you do." We'll play Simon Says, but at least that game I can quit whenever I want to. Right? No one likes that. But here's the deal: this is a good thing 
Because the God we follow is the God we were meant to follow. It's the God we follow has a world that this world cannot understand. And he's gone, this thing is better than it is right now. And Jesus said this of worldly leaders. He said, worldly leaders take their authority and they lord it over the people they lead. They push them around. They said, no, you're going to do this because I'm in charge. And I'm not going to do what I'm telling you to do because I'm in charge. I don't have to do that. I'm going to do I'm going to lord it over you. I'm going, to, I'm going to push you around. I'm going to show you who's in charge. I'm going to show you who's boss. And he just looked at his leaders. And the guys who started the church, he said, not so with you. Because that's not how it works in the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven will be the least. The first will be last, and the last will be first. And he said, listen, yeah, I'm in charge. But instead of being a God who lords my authority over people, I'm a God who dies for his people. Instead of a God who pushes people around, I'm a God who invites people. Follow me. Come to me. All who are weary, Bury, pick up your cross and follow me. Come with me. Come on the journey. Come be a part of what I'm doing. You can be a part of the mission of God. Anyone who wants it can come on in. Follow me. It's an invitation. The Bible tells us that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Isn't that something we want spreading around the globe? Wouldn't that be a good thing for that to spread around the globe? Where Jesus and his glory is spreading across the horizon and freedom is coming in its wake? And we can be a part of it? Man. And I know what you're thinking. I know, Garrett, it would be great. In fact, most of us hear things like what has happened with Christians' lives back in the past, and we go, yeah, I would love to do something like that. Every one of us in the room wants to do some massive, magical, amazing thing for God. But we fail a lot, don't we? Jesus says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And this is why we need to remember the gospel. Isn't that something that as we spread the gospel, we need to remember the gospel? That's <laughs> always a good thing to do. Because what the gospel says is that Jesus himself moved. He didn't see his throne in heaven. He didn't see equality with God being God as something he grasped or snatched at or held in lock and key and be his own thing. No, he, he left his throne. He moved. And he lived the life that we couldn't live. And he, when he was down here, he moved from here to there, and he went from there to there, and we talked with any person he could find in any situation. He said, I'll, I'll engage with this, that's fine. And Pharisees, people who wanted to kill him, would, would invite him to dinner. He's like, that sounds like a great plan to me. And they go, Jesus, they want to kill you. He's like, it's free food. And he just went. He just did things. And he would go. He moved like he's asking us to move. And he lived the life that we couldn't live. And then he died on a cross, a death that you and I could not die. And he rose from the dead and he said, now I want you to do it. But hear me when I say this. The Bible says that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is alive in you. And what's God asking you to do with that power? the sins of the world on your shoulders. He's not asking you to die on a cross and and raise from the dead and rescue people from sin and shame and conquer death in the grave. He's not asking you to do that. He's asking you is to go from here to there. I want you to go there. I want you to go talk to that person. I want you to be willing to move when I say move. I want you to be willing to go when I say go. But hear me, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. There have been a lot of Christians who 
God did just that with. And there have been a lot of Christians before us who said yes when God spoke. And now it's our turn. Now it's our turn to run with the ball. And I pray that we will be people that when God speaks, we say yes. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that he left his throne to come save us. But I pray that as Christians we will also not get lost in the fact that he also invites us to be part of his mission on earth. Man, I hope we never lose sight of that. I hope we never lose sight of the fact that, that God has honored us so much. to let us be a part of that. His mission. And I pray that whatever's standing in our hearts today, whatever is going, whatever that barrier is, whatever that thing is that's just standing in our way, that we'll remove it and we'll become people who say yes when you talk to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Remembering the gospel. That's the, the thing we have to do as we move through our lives. And that's why we take communion every single week. We take a moment in our week where we stop and we remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. That he died for us. That he, that he offered us forgiveness. and He's loved us when we were, when we were unlovable. And he said, just come to me. It's something this magnificent, this wonderful that made the, the John the Baptist say of Jesus, you know what? I must decrease so that he could increase. This is what, this is the mindset. This is the thing that, that makes Jesus unlike anything else in the world. So different, so wonderful, so magnificent that we would be foolish not to follow him to the ends of the earth. So as this next song comes, we invite you to come up to the front or into the back and take the bread and take the juice. And remember that the bread is his body that was broken for us. And the juice is his blood that was spilled for us. As a new covenant, <laughs> as a covenant of grace that says, I don't care where you came from, and I don't care where you're going, and I don't care what you've done, and I don't care about it, I just want you, and I want you to come to me. That's the new covenant. I want you to come to me. So as we take this, let's take the time to remember the love that we have from our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then let's worship Him as a family, as a body of believers. Father, thank You for Your Son, Jesus Christ, and His grace, and the salvation that comes in His name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you for having me back here. God bless.